question. What is there? Um, you know a lot about the the um, Aztec Empire, all that. Did they ex- did the Aztec Empire extend up into North America? No, no, no. they were pushed back by the Comanches. They were pushed back by the yeah. Well, well the, I mean, they, they, they pushed ex- back, but they didn't go up that way because. Well, it, it was thought that because the Comanches were from the Shoshone people, and that they were always very violent and warlike, and they before the horse was introduced. By the time the horses came, they came from the south up because, you know, Cortez and, and all the – Pizarro, they all came uh, from South America upward. So the horses ended up, you know, the Cheyenne and the Kiowa and the Comanche were all thought to have, have descended from the Shoshone. And they adopted the horses that, that were wild that had gotten free, you know, the Stetsons, the Mustangs, whatever, that had gotten free from the, the Spaniards. And so prior to that, there were no horses. And so the Aztec Empire was on the wane by the time the Comanches were on the rise. But it, it was said by the, the by the by the Aztecs, they had told, and there is a a guy, I'm gonna I'm gonna look this information up. There's a guy that wrote a book, he was a Spaniard. But he grew up as a boy amongst the the the, uh, the, uh, the conquered Aztecs, and he adopted their culture, and he became a monk, uh, f- a Franciscan monk. Um, and he literally wrote a book, and I can't remember the name of it, but I, I do some research, and I've read part of the book. I've read it o- online. But he talks all about their myths and their culture, and he gets into some you know whole bunch of stuff. And I believe, if I remember correctly, he talks about them not being willing to go beyond the Rio Grande. For whatever reason, any time that they had ever tried to go past the Great River, which at that time was, you they know. They didn't come back. They never came back. Nobody ever came back from it. So them being very superstitious, anybody that went north, you know, of of Mexico City, they never really came back. So they were they thought that that was the land of giants and demons and devils and wow. Because the reason I ask is because I, I read somewhere I saw somewhere that they found pyramid type structures in Wisconsin, mm-hmm. similar to the Aztec. Yeah, because and those go those go back before the Aztecs actually ended up in in uh, Tenochtitlan and and Teotihuacan was already built. Teotihuacan, they said, was the inhabitants of the gods. And it was built <clears throat> for larger people. And so it's really weird. And they were scared to go there. They didn't, they were scared. They believed that it was like a haunted, you know, place. And th- the Spaniards were in shock. They were like, why is there this huge, beautiful city that's uninhabited? Why was there no one there? But the, the Aztecs had their own reasons why they didn't go or do whatever. And some people believe that. The Comanches, you know, were already taking root in Texas and in northern Mexico. And even though they were horseless at that time, they were still, they had a penchant for violence and ambush. Never large in numbers, but enough to take out any kind of like, you know, small party of Aztecs that would make their way up that way, you know. And of course, the Aztecs were just a confederation of natives that decided to work together. The Mixtecs, Zapotecs, uh, you know, and so... What ended up happening, every time they conquered an area, they would just kind of incorporate them into the Aztec Empire until they had conquered all around uh, Lake Texcoco. And it just kind of expanded from there, you know. And the Tlaxcalans were the only ones that were were not were still a little bitty square in the middle of the heart of the Aztec Empire. And they were, the Aztecs were chipping away at it until the Spaniards came. And then they allied themselves with them and the Tabascans, ultimately overthrowing them. What's interesting, though— and I've had this conversation with Linda Godfrey. She she's like me. The Aztecs had a guy that they revered called Zolotl. Uh, Zolotl was actually a dog-headed deity. That was my next question. Yeah, and he was thought to to, to stalk in corn. And what I mean is like you know elote is very big in the Mexican culture. You're like me. We're both mixed. You know, like a cornfield or the cornfields. Yeah, Zolotl oh. was was thought to stalk you in the cornfields, and it, he was. It, it, they would put people, <laughs> very, very, very nice people, the Aztecs, they would take children and put them in the cornfields and Zolotl would kill them uh, as a and sacrifice. It would, as a sacrifice. Yeah. Or they would, when there was no rain, they would put them in this like weird uh, kind of funneling them in this little canyon and they would throw rocks on the, at them to make them cry and the tears would bring rain. 
It was horrific, the things they did. As you do, as everybody and knows. who knows nowadays. what was going on? Who was actually killing the children in the, the cornfields? Was it Zolotl or was it this some boogeyman Aztec dressed up as Zolotl? How many dog man reports do you get around cornfields? A lot. But if you trace the, the Aztec lineage, I believe that you can trace it all the way from Wisconsin and just different spots because their oral tradition, and I, I got to find this book. I got to look it up. Um, so I, I'll talk about it on the show one day once I, once I look it up because I remember reading part of it. And the cover of it is like, it's got like a, like a, what looks like a Spaniard, like a boy. And he's got like a feather on his, on his back of his head or something. But he talks about their myths, their legends. He spent a lot of time with them and he became a monk, like a, a priest. And so what's crazy when you look at, at at the progression and the oral history of the Aztecs, they say that they came from the north, you know, thousands of miles away, and that they stayed at certain spots, but that they kept being told to to go further, okay, to leave. And it's that, not that they migrated north; it's just that mig- they, they existed up north and migrated south. South, and then they ended gotcha. up, yeah, and and they were said to keep going until they found an eagle eating a snake on a cactus. Right. It's Mexico, Mexico City. Yes. Thing. Yeah. So eventually they claim that that's what happened. They they ended up in Lake Texcoco, which I think is bullcrap. I think it's just a myth. But some of this stuff is grounded in truth. Now, I believe that they did. They did. They were agrarian. And I believe that they farmed. But I think that they were at the mercy of Plains Indians and whoever else was more warlike and barbaric. And I think that what happened was there is some evidence that the that, that point that they were becoming aggressively human sacrificing, all that, that aggressively becoming a human sacrificing uh, uh, civilization. Yeah, like were way before they that. ended up in Mexico, they, they were already doing it. And I think what happened was that their neighbors didn't like that they would, <laughs> you know, because there, there's a legend of the Aztecs where there was a king that actually, I, and I, I can't remember the name of it. This is stuff I've read. You know, I don't have the notes in front of me. But they, they did him a great honor. This was when they were subjects to, I think, the, Tol, the Toltecs or the Mixtecs. But they, they were subjects at that time. So they invited this king that they were a vassal state of to come to this great honor and this feast. And the, his daughter... Uh, he they he brought his daughter whatever so they wanted to pay him pay homage to him. So what the Aztecs did they they come out with a with a priestess dancing around and he can see by the light of the moon that she's wearing like a skin or something, and then he realizes that it looks like his daughter. So this king he sees that this priestess is wearing a, his daughter's skin. So he flips out, dude. He's like, what the heck? And the Aztecs are all like, they're all shocked. Like, why are you mad? Like, this is a great honor. We're, we're best- we sent her to live with the gods, you know, and, and this dancing around in her skin like Ed Gein, you know, <laughs> is this great honor. So he got very angry and he drove them out into this little, like, I guess like island or whatever, where they kind of skulked for, you know, uh, 30, 40 years. And then eventually they rose back up and took over. Uh, persistence, much like the Romans did the Etruscans. You know, they, they, they pissed the Etruscans off. The Etruscans punished them over and over again, but eventually the Romans prevailed and the Latins defeated the Etruscans and overthrew them, much like the Greeks did the Minoans, you know. Makes me wonder if they, uh, this dog man is some type of uh, Aztec deity that could be demonic. No, oh, well... Very much so. Yeah, here it is. It says here, following an old custom, the body of, uh, of, of was flayed and a priest donned her skin in an ancient agricultural rite. See, everything's agricultural in them. Symbolizing the renewal of life. The unsuspecting chief, Akito, uh, his name is Akitometal, Akitometal, invited to participate in the concluding festivities, suddenly recognized the skin of his daughter, on the body of the priest. Now, of course, he flies into a rage. Is it an animal skin or? Oh, no, it was her. It was her skin. Oh, it was his daughter's his skin. His daughter's skin. 
That, and that, so that really aggravated him. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And whenever you re, you go into the, I've studied the Aztecs. And when you go and you read about the siege of Tenochtitlan, you learn that there was Man. a giant that was impervious to bolt to to musket balls and to arrows, and that what actually ended up they believe killed him was disease. Now, mm -hmm. here's a crazy thing: if you were to get into the whole. You know, in your dad being from Mexico, I spent time down in Mexico quite a bit, actually. And if you go, my stepdad, my mom's ex-husband had a ranch down past Monterey, down south of Monterey. And I traced my heritage, like the Medina family that where I came from, they were originally from Spain and they settled in an area near Sinaloa, like Guadalajara, like, you know, like in between Guadalajara, and Mexico City, that's where they were. And eventually, and I traced it up until Eagle Pass, you know, Piedras Negras, and they settled there for, for a, about, you know, two generations, and then they came over. But my great-grandmother was Comanche. My great-grandfather was a Spaniard, and his family was very white. You know, they looked like you, you know, or me. But my dad being, you know, white, he spent a lot of time down in the valley, which I did too subsequently because my dad – kind of split time down there and then living up in, in Taylor. And my dad, being the Caucasian guy though, uh, speaks pretty good Spanish and was, was, grew up, you know, around Mexicans. And so did my grandfather. My grandfather even did, you know, got in trouble for smuggling, you know, all kinds of people and everything else across the border. Um, did, did a little bit of time too in his sixties, like, because he was just, he was just an outlaw. <laughs> I mean, he just lived like an outlaw, you know, and, and I mean, he would take people's livestock and do all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, you'll find some Mexicans down near Mexico City in that area that uh, all have complected and got green, green eyes. Very much. My grandfather had green eyes. Yeah. It's, it's the Spanish influence or something mm -hmm. like that. And my great grandmother being Comanche, you know, she was darker skinned and she, she was 97 by the, her birth certificate when she died. But my my family thinks that she was well over a hundred because she she said that she had been alive for four winters and five summers. So I don't know what does that mean. I mean, so she but when 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 the, the the people came and they 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 said that she was so malnourished, she didn't look like a five year old. She looked like you know she was barely a toddler, like maybe one or two years old, because she was so malnourished when they took her in. They, yeah, my grandmother was from Oaxaca, and she had a native uh, name, Watuk or something mm -hmm. like that. I can't remember exactly what it was. And Oaxaca is actually spelled O-A-X. Yeah. Yeah, it's just for those who don't know. It's it's not spelled like Oaxaca. You can't look it up like that. Right. Yeah. But uh, it's, uh, you know, it's just it's very interesting. You know, it's, my uh, grandfather was in the, uh, he was kind of like an aristocrat in Mexico City. He was He was in the army. And uh, he was going through a village on his horse, had his white uniform on. She saw him, fell in love with him. And uh, yeah, my great grandfather was a soldier too. Yeah, rest yeah. is history. <laughs> so, yeah, that's crazy. Mexico is an interesting cause multiple cultures. You mm -hmm. know, it's like a you know, it's an interesting country, an interesting culture. I, I'll tell you a, a story I got out of Laredo. Um, and, and I was, I used to spend a lot of time down on the border towns, dude. I used to, I used to run around in Matamoros, yeah. uh, Nuevo Laredo, Piedras Negras, Acuna, uh, Juarez. I spent a lot of time and I, and I knew a lot of interesting people. <laughs> used to do a lot of interesting things that I'm not going to talk about, but I used to spend time, you know what I mean? Like I, <laughs> yeah. I I've been on boats, I've been on planes, I've done a lot, there's been a lot of little, little mishaps and things that I did over the years and spending time across, and I've been in Guatemala. Did some things and went and did some stuff, but I, I got a very interesting story uh, from a rancher right outside of well, north, south of Nuevo Laredo, and they talked about these little what I would only describe them as thieving little coyote men, um, because they they would come and they would they were something was taking their chickens. Now here's where it gets interesting. You're gonna think I'm crazy when I tell you this. I just I just was like looking through my archives the other day and I found this report and I told my brother about it. I mean, my brother started talking. I said, do you remember this? Because the guy that gave us this story, um, his name was Javier. We called him Javi. And he, you know, he was a friend of ours and he used to raise gamecocks, chickens that would spur you, kill you. And he had 
he had one one game cock that he it was funny. What's his name? He, he named it Kramer because you know Seinfeld or whatever. So we were there, and he was they, they his his girlfriend or what? I don't know if she was his girlfriend or his wife, whatever. She would be watching Seinfeld in Spanish, and that was like you know. And so so she it was her favorite show, and this is back in the nineties, right? And so she he named this 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 gamecock Kramer, and he's like, dude. You know, there was predation all the time. He said, El Chupacabra, you know, would come and they would take our livestock, you know, whatever. It was like little mini dog men. The, yeah, but, but what's what's crazy, though, is uh, the, here's what's crazy. This story, his son, his son, Junior, told me, he says, ay, mentiras, no, it's Chupacabra. He said, it's, you know, it's big, you know, like grande, you know, you know, you know, manos grande, you know, like a big man, you know, gi- giant man. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's, and he started describing it to me. And my brother was like, Bigfoot? This sounds like Bigfoot. It sounds like a Sasquatch, you know? You got Sasquatch sightings down there. Oh, a lot. A lot of them. So he said, no, nah, he said, this thing, he it took, you know, the, 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 the several of the chickens, you know? And he said that, you know, the guy, you know, he took the rooster. When he took Kramer, like, he got really, really pissed off. Like, he was mad. So him and his son went out into the woods, or his two sons, his son Diego and his son Junior, whatever. And they went out into the woods to to find this thing, to kill it. And Javier was like, dude, he goes, we went up in a tree. He's like, and I look down and I see this guy. He said, a guy. He goes, very thick accent, but he can speak English. But he said, he goes, Patron. He always called me Patron. He said, Patron, I see. He's a big man. He come out of the woods. Two little duendes with him. And I was like, duendes? Little monitos? And he says, ay, monito, like, uh, you know. Pedro, you know, I said like a dog, yeah. And he and he said they were on two legs, you know, dos, you know. And I said, well, and I said, I, you know, I don't know about that, man. And I was like, I was looking at him. I was like, I mean, I've heard of the mini dog man. Yeah, before. and I told him, I still get a carajo, man. You, you know, you're crazy, bro. <laughs> you know. And he said, no, for real. He said, man. I, he goes, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm in this tree. He goes, and I see this big giant. It looks like a giant. Like a big giant man, he's telling me this in half Spanish, and he said, and then behind him, this little duende, he called them duendes, but they looked like they were wearing dog heads. And I said, wearing dog heads? He goes, yeah, I don't know. He's trying to say like, you know, brother, they look like dogs, but they're like little man, you know. And I said, I said, well, I don't, I don't understand what you mean. I'm not joking. I'm not making this up. My brother saw this, and we started drinking and ha- hanging out, and partying, whatever. My brother was there with my other friend Squid, and 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 if I ever get Squid on the show, I can get him to tell, confirm a bunch of this stuff. They were in the other room, and we were all partying, and I was playing dominoes, right? And and like we hung out with these guys, and their families. They were very nice people. And one of his teenage uh, daughters showed them a picture that she snapped a photo with a disposable camera. I mean, not a disposable camera, a. Uh, what are they called? The, the instant cameras or whatever? The co- the, yeah, the, yeah. the old instant The yellow ones. I, yeah. You take a picture of it and you shake it. What is oh, it called? Polaroid. The, Polaroid. Polaroid, yeah. He, she pulled out a Polaroid of one of these creatures. So my brother and, and this other guy, they actually saw, I didn't see it. I didn't, I was drinking and playing dominoes. I wasn't into what they were doing. So the next day we're packing up and we're leaving. We're heading back to Nuevo Laredo. And this is like I said, in the back in the 90s, like 98. Something like that. And my brother goes, dude, she had a picture of a werewolf. And I was like, what? You know, it's kind of hard to fake a Polaroid. You, know? you can't. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If somebody could get a Polaroid, that'd be a little more convincing. Now, I got a picture from a Polaroid of one of my listeners. Um, his name is, uh, well, actually, you know, he asked me not to say anything, but I'll, I'll tell you off air. I'll, I'll. I'll even get in touch, get you in touch with him, and he. I'll I'll let see if he'll show you. He listens to the show. All right, he's a Puerto Rican dude. He's got a, a very weird photo, okay, and it came from a Polaroid, and he he sent it to me. I'll I'll try to get it, his name for you. I'll 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 tell you after off camera off air. So anyway, he said, dude. He goes, yeah, my brother's like you know very nonchalant. And I was like, what? And I was already about you know. 30 kilometers in, you know, I wasn't going to turn around and go back and I had to get back across the border, you know, I had things to do. And I said, dude, what are you, are you kidding me? And Squid's like, yep. He's like, we saw, it was a picture, dude. It looked like a little, like a little dude, like it was a little guy. 
And you can see this big shadow kind of next to it or behind it. And I said, dude, is that what Javier was talking about? Like there was this giant, like Bigfoot type creature next to these two little whatever. So I was saving this because I, I have several stories from Mexico. So what I wanted to do was put a chapter in my book about, you know, for the international cryptids or whatever. And I, and I kind of ran out of room on the book because I, I, I had to, I have to keep it under a certain number of words. Right. And so I thought, you know what, the next time I write a book, I want to do one and just do a whole chapter on the stories I got from Mexico. Because not only that, I got like weird chupacabra stories too, man. Um, some out of Monterey, you know, like right out of there, you know, like, and then some down near the Yucatan, I got some really weird stories, like lizard man stories, but you know, and then of course there's a bunch of weird stories that come out of the, uh, the beach down at the bottom, you know, the base, you know, the, the Yucatan basin or whatever, Yucatan, uh, peninsula. And so every, every region, and then I got another one, uh, about these weird looking creatures that look like jaguar men. But, they, but you know, and that's Ziptotec or Ziptotec, however you say it, the Mayan god that was a jaguar or jaguar headed dude. And, you know, when you're getting out of the jungle, you get these stories of these things that look like half man, half jaguar. And the Mayans believed in, in that, you know. I don't know exactly how to pronounce it because I never had anybody like, like tell me exactly how to say it. I've only read it. Um, and, and I've looked for like when I was down there, but I was briefly, I was down there briefly in the jungle when I, before I went over down into Guatemala, but I asked a couple of the locals down in there if they knew, you know, they'd heard stories or anything like that. And of course they heard stories, but nobody, they weren't Mayan. So they didn't really know, you know, about Zipi Totec or Zip Totec or how you say his name. Um, and Mexico's got these flying humanoids too down a there. A bunch of them, dude. I'm like. Holy Mexico's Christ. full of weird stuff, dude. It is so weird. And, and of course, you know, they, they the scientists believe that, you know, 65 million years ago, that's where the asteroid hit was right there in the Yucatan. And then it just, the whole world <laughs> changed. Um, and some people think that that was alien influence that caused it. Who you knows know? what the Aztecs could have conjured up to? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, with all the blood rituals are very powerful. Oh, I know. And they were doing them like on a large scale. Like it was massive. Um, the, the largest human sacrificing, you know, in, in history, you know. And so when you when you start to go back and you look at these stories, it didn't surprise me, you know, that that, that the, you know, my brother and them told me that story. But I never really knew what to do with that. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to write these stories out or – just, you know, and just the other day I was telling Tony, we should do a story or a show just about Mexico, just based on the, Because, <laughs> yeah, I think we were talking about, it was after we did that Japan show. And then we were going to do the Philippines. Yeah, then we were just talking about, like, doing different other countries. Different countries. So, we were kind of holding those to our vest, but, why, you know, you used you to would... live in Mexico and you're here, you might as well tell it, you know. Why save it? Because I got so many, dude, that I'm like, I could just spit them out for years. I think it was in Texas, mid to late seventies. They had a lot of um, flying bat, huge bat-like creatures. That mm -hmm. People were reporting. I, I think my mother says she saw one one time here in Texas. In Texas, oh, right yeah. down South First Street. Yeah, yeah. We, I've we gotten we them from Austin. There. We lived down there, and uh, you know, I think we were packing up something, getting ready to move. She came outside, and we had like a carport over our front door. Mm -hmm. She walked out from under the carport, and it was a full moon. She saw this. Huge bat winged type creature, you know, fly in front of the moon. And she said it was huge. I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> I didn't know what to think of it at the time. But uh, then I started reading about accounts during that time period, central and south Mexico, Texas, that, that they were seeing these bat creatures, huge humanoid bat type creatures. And uh, I was like, well, maybe she did see something like that. So. You know, speaking of Mexico, Rick, I got a story from some people. They're they're from Mexico, and, and one of them is a friend of ours who who sells tacos. So he's a really really good guy, and uh, he's always hooking us up, whatever. But his cousin, she told us a story one time, and I guess she wasn't supposed to tell it because her other cousin got mad and kind of got embarrassed, you know. And they they I think that they think that we're going to look at them as crazy or something. But I like put him at ease. And I said, look, you know, and she didn't speak real good English, but she communicated it to us. And what happened was they live in an area near, it's called Elroy and it's, it's Southeast of Austin before you get to Buda. 
And the interesting thing about this is I got two reports of what could possibly be the same creature from two different females that live about, I think, I would say probably 10 miles from each other. And both times it was identical. It was, this is what's really weird. The first report we got was from the one in Buda. And this was from my, my friend, another friend of mine who his first cousin, her, his sister listens to the show. I know that I don't think his little, her, her little sister does, but she's the one that told the story to her sister. And then she related to me. It's real brief. I mean, she was walking outside to take her trash out. And this is like a subdivision. Okay. This isn't like, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, like the other story in Elroy. This is like right there. She's like, we got neighbors. I mean, they can look outside and see this thing. Very similar to how the situation was with the dog man down in South Austin. This thing was like right there in her yard at like nine, 10 o'clock at night. A Bigfoot type creature? Bigfoot. Absolutely a Bigfoot. Wow. Squatch. She said as she stared at it, this is what's interesting though, that she started to notice that it, it looked angry. It looked agitated and it was like kind of pacing back and forth. And she said it was about eight feet tall. Um, not not real muscular hulking looking thing like you would think of as Sasquatch, but like kind of scrawny. Like she said it had like skinny arms, but but muscular, you know? And she said that it had like a weird looking midsection and that the legs looked human. It was very human looking legs, but that it was covered in fur. And I asked her that too. I said, hair or fur? She's like, no, like like fur, you know? She speaks good English. She's Mexican American, but she's not from Mexico. But she she related to me that it had red eyes. Like like literally, and it and like the longer she stared at it, the more I the more the eyes were becoming like a darker more brighter, like darker, like, I mean, not darker, a deeper, brighter red. And she said, she was sitting there staring at it. And she's like, it was like, it was wanted to say something to me, but it just seemed so angry. And so she dropped the trash and ran inside and her husband comes out and doesn't see anything. So about two years go by, that was like 2020, two years go by. And I get a report in um, like two, uh, last year, I guess it was last, uh, it was probably last winter, I guess. And this is the guy that, that, that like, I, I know this guy. He told me his cousin has a story, whatever, but he didn't know if she wanted to tell it or her sister. <laughs> there again, just kind of volunteered it. And then she felt kind of embarrassed, I guess. But she said that her little sister was taking out the trash. Same thing. Very, very weird. Very, and saw the same thing and had the same experience, except this one actually, like, turned and walked away from her. And just kind of went off into the woods. And she said that what was really messed up was like they had a little white spitz, a dog, that went missing. And she thinks that that creature did something to it. But did both of them were angry, though, in both encounters? Both of them had red eyes, the same color, the build. Everything was the same. Could have been the same one. Could have been the same sure. creature. It sounds like it was the same yeah. one. So that that was interesting. I mean, you know, and, and a little sad, of course, that her dog disappeared. But... There, there's not, I mean, I don't have to even give the description of the second one because it was pretty much identical to the first one. Right. So it was just kind of like, whatever. Now, out there in Elroy, <clears throat> they burn their trash. They have to burn their trash. And one of the, the people, I think it, Kenny probably knows this guy. He told me a story years ago about a a Sasquatch. And this, like I said, this this story I got probably early 2000s or something. And this, I just remember we were at the club and we were all, and the reason I said Kenny is Kenny used to live out there and he's the guy that works for us. He's going to come on the show one day and tell his encounters. He's got a bunch of stuff that's happened. One of Scorp's best friends. Yeah, it's Scorpion's best friend or, you know, former roommate. They all lived together. There, there was three of them, all these uh, bozos that all lived together. They're all friends of mine. But they're, <laughs> it's like you go over there and it's like typical bachelor pad, nowhere to sit. Oh, there's a banana peel right there. I better not sit down. You know, one fork, one spoon. The only time they cleaned it, yeah, one fork, one spoon. (laughs) They cleaned it up, threw everything in the closet when girls came over, and then that was it. Everything else was, so you go over there and you're looking around going like, I'm not sitting down anywhere in this place. I mean, I had a badge, but I took care of my pad. But anyway, long story short, I I, I go in there and and, and I talk to this uh, friend of a friend, I guess. I didn't know this guy that well. And we were playing cards at the end of the night. And we were all, and, and of all things, gin rummy. And how drunk do you got to be to say, let's play gin rummy. So we played gin rummy. And so we're sitting there playing cards. And this guy's like, yeah, I saw Bigfoot one time, man. I heard that you collect stories. And I go, I do. 
and I'm kind of focused on what I'm doing. And if it's one of Kenny and Scorpion's friends, I'm probably thinking this guy, you know, who knows, dude. And your stepdad was there. So he kind of pushed the issue and he's like, well, tell us about your Bigfoot encounter. And he goes, dude, he's like, I was on the other side of Elroy. When he said Elroy, I had heard stories about Elroy for a long time about Bigfoot being out there. So I kind of, I was like, you got my attention, you know, like Dave Chappelle. <laughs> but it was, he said, he goes, I used to live in Lockhart. He goes, and then I had a, a run in with this, this uh, thing, you know? And so he said, dude, I, and it was on our property. And he goes, he says, so we moved. So we moved further in closer to Austin to Elroy. He's like, and I think he goes, the damn thing followed me. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, he goes, so I, at that point, I put my cards down and I was like, what, what, what are we talking about here? Because it sounded interesting. This guy was, he wasn't, he had just gotten there. He wasn't real, he wasn't drunk and going, yeah, I saw back for it, you know. Then it became more like maybe it was a real story. Um, but the thing is, he never got a really good look at this thing. But he described it as a large, hairy, bipedal, you know, ape-like creature. But the weird thing was that it had a short tail. He, he he saw the face that he ever. That was the thing. He you know I, th that's why I don't know if it was a Bigfoot or or a dog man. And so I started talking and I said, look, I saw a creature that some people would say was a Bigfoot with a snout and a tail and backward bent legs, which is pretty much not a Bigfoot. It's a werewolf. And I said, is there a chance that what you saw you know was. So he said the thing he saw in Lockhart was a, was very massive, very large, and he, his his son and his stepdaughter had both seen it, and it looked like what he described that to them. They described it as a, a, a Sasquatch. But he said one day he was with his wife, and the only good look he got at it was it jumping a fence, and it had a short tail. And I said, dude, a tail, dude? Like, what is it? Did it have a snout? He goes, I don't know. Feet. Normal. It just just said it was like a normal, like the legs look like the giant legs of a, a hairy man, you know. You know, there's some type of a cryptid that uh, looks like that, but it has like a short snout. They call it the gugwe. Gugwe, yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. They got a picture of it holding a dog. This the beast of seven shoots photo. Yeah. yeah, and everybody's tried so hard to debunk it, and nobody can really just say what it is. Looks like it's got the, the snout doesn't isn't exceptionally long. It looks like kind of like a um. A baboon snout. It does. And the head is kind of like pointed at the top. Yeah. You know, it's got that sagittal crest or whatever they call it. Um, but th this this guy, though, he is, if I remember correctly, his name was Mark. I, I got to ask Scorpion and I should have asked Kenny when I had him on the phone. Um, but he, they just, his friend was very adamant. And this guy was not just some goofball. Like he, you know, he ran a tire shop at one point, And I remember him coming to the club pretty regularly. And he told me, like a couple encounters like that other people had had in that area that had seen it and it had glowing red eyes, <clears throat> very squatch like, but glowing red eyes. What, what's up with the glowing red eyes? I don't know. I guess some with glowing amber, some with glowing, glowing green. I wonder what color signify to them. Cause it's obviously, I mean, I don't know. It, it might, Maybe it's an emotional state or something. It might be know. nothing, but like we talk about green mist, white mist, and you know, black mist. And the green is, is very prevalent. Yeah. Me and Linda Godfrey had gone down there, but also did Barton. But then you have these eye colors too, yellow eyes, red <laughs> eyes, and you know, like what, what what does that all mean? Maybe does red it? eyes signify they were smoking. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever hear that story that Linda Godfrey told about, she, well, she interviewed the animal control officer? up there in Wisconsin. And he was talking about, because she went into his office one day and uh, she looked at his desk and he had a little folder. Oh, yeah, the folder. With werewolf on it. It was a police officer. I thought it was animal control. It was a police no, I, th I thought it was a police officer. She, she interviewed yeah. a police officer. But she, she said she saw that and she started asking questions. She says, you know, she's a reporter. She's got to ask. Mm -hmm. What's this werewolf thing? So he started talking about the uh, sightings that he saw. And he says that at the same time, there were a lot of um, ritual killings of animals mm -hmm. in that same area. Uh, ritualistic uh, animal sacrifice. They're assuming animal sacrifice because they, they conjured it up. Yeah, uh, possibly. And he says that um, it was really weird because when she brought that up and they started talking about it, the books on his shelf started flying off the shelf. Wow. And then, you know, she, she talked about an, an incident of, uh, well, I think it was in Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin, 
where there's a uh, a school for children ran by the Catholic Church. And uh, there was a night watchman that walked the grounds during the night. And there was an, it was an old Indian mound, burial mound there. And uh, he ran into a dogman type creature digging in the mound. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, he's, uh, he said something gersamine or something biblical. But you know, she also said that she found out that uh, in the school itself, they had an exorcism of a little boy at the same mm-hmm. time. Yeah. And the name, it, it, it corresponded to something in Hebrew. Yeah, well, it's um. It was a town. Um, there was a Gessamine, town. Gehenna or no? You the Gessamine demoniac. You ever heard of that? Yeah, but I, I don't think that's what it was. I no, it was, something like I thought. I can't remember precisely what Adara, it was. Adara. Uh, something like it. Yeah, Adora, Adora, it was Adara, Adora. wasn't it? Yeah, Adara, which is Gadora. Good, yeah, Gadara, Gadara, which is like a region that the Gessamine demoniac lived mm-hmm. in. I, now, I don't know if there's a connection, but. Uh, well, that, that that's interesting because uh, one of my friends who's well, he's Lebanese, he's Marianite, and but he talked about Baalbek, and one of these creatures that they saw near Baalbek. Or look it up. It was once the, the god of the Phoenicians was Baal, you know, in that area, the Canaanites, and he said that Baalbek, where they they the Islamic people when they when they the, uh, the Muslim conquest, they covered it up. They, they closed it off. It's, it was called the mouth of hell because the people used to make sacrifices to Baal and throw people into that pit and they could actually hear <clears throat> screams and yell, whatever, from, from the pit. That's the, the oral tradition that was passed down. Did you hear about the, the digs that they were doing in the Tigris River in Iraq? The Tigris River, yeah. They found some uh, – There was the Tigris River – Lowered, it's, I don't know, the, the inner drought or something, and the water level was very low, and they mm-hmm. found some caves. Mm-hmm. They started audio taping the caves, and yeah, they found screams. The screams. Yeah, and then you got the now you got the Euphrates going dry. It's uh, very biblical. It's the Tigris River or the Euphrates. Yeah, the River. Tigris and the Euphrates are both the very big rivers over there in in, in that area. Um, <clears throat> if if you if, 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 if like what he was saying though at Baalbek was there was this creature that people were seeing in and around that thing, like near, near this covered spot, and that they could hear screaming and yelling, and it, wow. it, supposedly it was the sounds from demons that were down in there. You the know? sounds of hell or something. Yeah, like and this, there was a flying humanoid that was seen in that area. You know, and it, he said it looked just like a gargoyle, like a skinny, thin gargoyle. But they, but he, would, he talked about see, them seeing these weird – Dog man looking creatures that would like disappear, like they would they'd be running along and they just disappear into the air, and they they called them sand spirits, like they were from the sands. Well, U.S. forces they saw stuff like that over yeah. there, disappearing rock. I mean, they were pulling guard duty and guard shack and or guard tower, and they would see these things out in the field yeah. running, and you could see them. I, I, I've, I've interviewed soldiers too in Colleen that talked about seeing these Bigfoot looking creatures in their NVGs. And then they would just they would be there one minute and then they're gone the next. But there was this there was this uh, story that we got and these people speaking of Filipinos, I was going to tell this story because me and Tony filled this story. And it was uh, from the Overlook. Now there's two Overlooks in Austin. If you go and I'll show you, one is a giant cliff that overlooks this bridge that was donated to us by by Japan. I believe that the bridge didn't come from Kyoto or something like that. Like it was a friendship gift or something. Yeah, I think it was something like that. Like it was or Osaka or something. Yeah. Yeah. The one, our sister city in Japan, I guess Austin has one, I guess, and they gave us a bridge. Really? Yeah. There's right. like a metal bridge or whatever. The steel came from there. Let's see if I can look it up real quick. And yeah, just look it up. Japan. They gave us a bridge. So anyway, there's an overlook, a real beautiful spot, and I've been up there a couple times. <clears throat> but you, there's always people there. There's like a lot of foreign people. And they, they, they walk up, you got to walk up and then go and look over it. And these people, they were Filipino. And one of them used to work with Scorpio, you know, years ago. And they, they told us a story recently. Like, he goes, hey, I heard you have a show. This is just like a few weeks ago. He's like, I got a story of something like you were talking about, bat-like. And it flew over me and my family. It was me and my three brothers and sisters and my cousins and my aunt and uncle and my dad, my mom and dad. It was a bunch of us. We were up on the on the hill. Of course, they're all from the Philippines, <clears throat> and he used to work for the Navy. He, he wasn't in the Navy, but he worked for the Navy. He was, you know, they do the Westpac, 
and he worked on a ship like he was uh, like a civilian contract. Yeah, civilian contract. That's what I was, I was trying to say say the words. So he, he he said we were up there on the on the ridge or whatever. And he goes and dude, we we hear this screech, and we look up and we see what looks like the a, a giant bat, just gigantic, dude. He said it had to have been six foot, and the wingspan was about eight to ten feet. And he said it went right over us and then went down over the the river, and just kept going. And it was you know it just kind of disappeared. He goes, and then as we were leaving, we look up and we see probably what looked like the same creature swooping over the bridge and then going back over by our car. And he goes, we were trying to take pictures of it, but all we got was darkness, you know. And he said that it was like a br- like what he could see was brownish black, and he said it just looked like a like a like a bat. But he goes, but it had legs, like long legs, like a humanoid, dude. He goes, it was so weird looking, dude. And it had these weird bat-like uh, wings with like a bat head. And he said that, it, but it had like what looked like legs coming off of it. It's called the the Penny Backer Bridge. And it, our sister city is uh, O-I-T-A. I don't know how to say that. Oida? O- Oida? Oida. In Japan? Yeah, that's our yeah. sister city. And they're the ones that donated the... They donated the, the metal for the Penny Backer Bridge. Yeah, the, the bridge, yeah. Also and known as the 360 Bridge. The 360 Bridge, yeah. But, and so here's another one. I had a guy who was from uh, uh, Slovakia. And he was walking over that. And, and I met him from somebody who used to work for me years ago. And she's like, hey, man, I got this guy who's got a story, you know, from, from he's from Slovakia. So she translated because he didn't speak very good English and it was kind of hard. But he claims to have been walking across that bridge. This is creepy. Get this. He's going across in the middle of the night, like three in the morning, and he hears like this screeching noise. It sounds like a bat. And this what can only be described as a Batman. No, not the DC Batman. But uh, Tony gets all excited. Batman? He's like a Batman freak. I don't know why you're a Batman freak. I don't like Batman. I've said that before. Rich man's son. But whatever. This thing flips up and, and like lands right in front of him. And he said it's like sl- squatted down. And it's kind of moving, like kind of waddling toward him, but it had legs that it was kind of dragging behind it, like like legs, like skinny, elongated, weird looking with with weird feet, and it had like long, like long, like wings sticking out, and then it just took off up in the air and was gone, and then kind of like it went down and then went back under the bridge, and it really wasn't interested in him. He said he just kind of looked at him and tilted its head side to side, and then it was just back under the bridge and gone. And that's weird because, you you know, you're telling me this story about your family, your mom seeing a, a, a bat. What, what year was that? Because th- this, this one, was, this uh, story was in 2009. This was probably April of 75. Yeah, that was like before I was born. That kind of sounds, what you were describing, kind of sounds like man bat more than Batman. Yeah. If you look up the common character, Man Bat. We got Bat Squatch, too. Bat Squatch, yeah. But this guy from <laughs> Slovakia, so... he had a name for it. But, uh, yeah, it, it's weird because, like, like she, she was telling me that his, and I guess she dated this guy, whatever. I don't know their whole history, whatever. But she worked for us for a little while. This guy, his whole, and I don't remember his name. He had, like, a whatever Slovakian name or whatever. Um, I don't know a whole lot about their legends and stuff. I know that my grandmother or my, my step grandmother, my, which I was, was my only grandmother I ever really knew because my, my Walitha died when I was like two. My dad's mom died when he was three. So I didn't really know them. My Thea Hova was kind of like my surrogate grandmother, my grandmother's sister. And then my step grandmother, Sophie, she was Czech. And I knew some of the the legends and stories from her, but Czechoslovakia was really two countries that they put together. And she was from the Czech Western part, not Slovakia. And the Slovakians, like, I don't know, like, a whole lot. I just know it all kind of blends together, some of their stories, like, you know. Um, but I just, I just, he had said something to her about, there was a, a story uh, of a vampiric type creature from where he was from. In northern or north, I guess northwestern Slovakia, and in that region where he was from, <clears throat> there was a creature similar to that, but I forgot what they called it. But it was like a vampiric type creature, but it looked kind of like a bat, which would make sense if it's a 
some 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 sort of vampire bat and who knows what these people were doing back in the day what kind of DNA they were mixing and what kind of chimeric, you know what I mean? Like what they were doing, what they were doing, the Anunnaki, you know I mean? They could have been playing with all kinds of stuff. It could have been Tiamat, who knows, but you get all these legends and stories. Now here's another one I got of a man bat type creature, but this one was extremely aggressive. And I, this one came out of, uh, th- this one came out of a place out of Guerrero and Guerrero has been traditionally like a very poor, um, part of uh, Mexico, but I want to say it correctly. It was called Chipan, Chipan single, Chipan single. I, it's, 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 I don't know how to pronounce, say it without making it sound kind of, I don't really know, you know, anything about that city or whatever. It's just a story that I got in an email, <clears throat> but these guys were driving around in a Jeep, you know, and they were, they were taking the back roads and they were just having a good time. And the youngest one was like 17. The oldest one was like 23 or something like that. There was like three or four guys and they were just having fun. And this thing just came out of like a tree line and just, and it was right next door to some ranch, somebody's ranch or whatever. And they, here's the weird thing. Like the guy that told me the story that gave me the email, like he lives in San Antonio now. But these were his cousins, and he was down in Mexico visiting his family. And he, the way he, he kind of like, a lot of times people give you a story that they don't tell you, hey, I saw a vampire, I saw a whatever. They, but this guy was pretty adamant that what he saw was this guy that was the, that was the rancher that lived there. Yeah, I know. It's a weird story. And so oh. I asked him, so this guy's name is Henry. So I said, Henry, I said, what? What do you mean it's the guys that, that was him? And he goes, dude, this guy, there's, there's stories of this guy. He's a vampire, like legends of this guy. And the people had claimed to see him literally drinking blood from animals. Like, this is what he told me. I'm not saying this is what I believe or whatever. But this is what he told me. But this is all just hearsay of people in the area who said that this guy was like a vampire. Here's what's weird. Now, Henry's dad told him that when he was a little kid, and his dad's like in his 60s now, and when this happened, I think he said it was in 2013, he said that his dad told him when he was a kid that that guy looked like he was 35 years old, and now he still looks like he's 35 years old, and he's like in his 60s. And he said that his dad knew this guy, and his grandfather knew this guy, and this guy didn't age. So what he saw swoop down off of these trees that, that, that were planted on the, on, on the other side of the fence of this ranch, he said that this guy came, he said, this is how, he described him as this guy, like he said it was this guy. He didn't say it was like a monster, a beast, whatever. He said that there were stories of this guy being like a vampire that people had seen him shapeshift. Like this is what he told me. He goes, dude, and I'm, he goes, I'm not making this up. This is a real story. And I've gotten a lot of stories from Mexico, dude. And you don't know, like sometimes it's just, it's kind of like when, when native people tell you stories, like it's like you, sometimes you don't know if it's like, uh, embellished or what is the words I'm trying to look for? Not folklore, but it's like, where do the lines, like from what their folklore, I guess folklore is and what they believe, like they look at something and they see it. You know what I mean? Some would say they see it for what it is and we're the ones that don't see it for what it is. But when I, okay, let's just be honest. If I saw a giant man bat looking thing, I'm going to be like, that's a vampire. That's not the first (laughs) thing I'm going to think. You know what I mean? But, but if you live in that area, right. And you grew up in that area and you grew up with this guy being a landowner. Now he could be a rich guy and they just don't like him because he's rich guy. yeah. Yeah. And so they make up stories about him being, you know, he's an eccentric weirdo or something. I asked this guy that. Henry works at a body shop now. Since I've known this guy for years. Like, he's not just a listener. He's like somebody I've known. And so I said, Henry, I said, come on, man. Don't pull my leg. He says, no, dude. He goes, he goes, man, I went down to my cousins, told me the whole story. They told me the whole story. He goes, this guy, he's a freaking vampire, dude. I'm not joking. He goes, Mexico's full of, you know, brujedia. You know? Like, like it's a lot of black magic, right? And I told him, I said, man, so what do you think it is? He goes, dude, it looked like a dude, man. He goes, I'd never seen this guy, like, you know, like 
look like like did, did this this vampire guy. You know what I mean? I mean, I had never seen him like change or do anything weird. He just looked like a normal guy to me. He's like, but my family's from there. He goes, and I can tell you right now. And he 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 gave me the thing in the email on the map, the name or whatever. I don't know how to pronounce it or whatever. I could have it's. It's the the capital of what? Uh, it's the second largest town. If anyone needs to find it, and and where at? And in, in Guerrero, right? Guerrero, yeah, yeah. It's the capital of Guerrero. It's though. the capital of Guerrero. And the okay. second largest city. Yeah, right, yeah. But anyway, it's like I guess south of there. It's it's not there. It's like outside of there. But according to him, there was a guy that lived out there, and he owned a big ranch, and like he had outlived like three or four wives, supposedly. And so I said, you really believe that this flying entity or whatever was that guy? He said, yeah, I do. He said it had its same build. He said it had like a weird bald head with a protruding lower jaw. The guy had a, like an underbite. But he, And I said, dude, and he goes, it swooped down low enough right by us, right over our heads where you could look up and see him. And he said it. And he said it had like wings, not like, like a bat, how the, the arms are attached to the wings, but over its back. Like a like a diablo, like a devil, he said. And and so I said, dude, so this thing looked like a gargoyle, devil, vampire. He goes, dude, yeah, all of the above. Yeah, basically. And he's like, I don't know what it was, dude. He goes, but, you know, there's a lot of weird stuff down there. You know, so he said that that area and that area where they were at, they were running around down there. Um, and, like, it was miles from the, the capital, but it was like, you know, he's a landowner or something in that area. And the rumors were that he was a vampire. And the people that worked for him said he had never seen him in the daytime. I mean, like, like for real, vampire. I knew uh, that I heard a story about a uh, a girl in California. She was uh, she was richly sexually abused, and uh, they used to take her out in the middle of the desert. I forgot where it was. Um, somewhere in Southern California, probably near the uh, Joshua Tree National oh, Forest. Yeah. They used to take him out there and they'd do these rituals. And there was this bruja that would, you know, hit up everything. And she said she actually saw him <clears throat> transform into a wolf. And then he would run around them and wow. then stop and, and transform back. Yeah, you know, and there was a guy, what was it Anthony was telling us the other day about some preacher that he was watching? And the guy said that he did a ritual to become a vampire. Oh, that's right. And he said that the, it, it wouldn't work. So then they brought some creature out and he drank his blood. Mm -hmm. I was going like, what the freaking heck? Like, I mean, Anthony just was telling me this and he gave me the link and I haven't even looked at it because I don't have time. Like, you know that I have time to scratch my head, you know, or I would have met you earlier today, but it was, it was so bizarre what he was telling me. But then I remember watching this guy talk about, like, I didn't get to watch much of it. It was just like a video. And it was like a, it was a preacher and he was saying werewolves and vampires are real. Now, if you ask my friend Henry, he saw a vampire, he believes it was real. He believes it was that guy. And so I said, what was his name? You know? And he goes, I don't know his name. He goes, dude, he's just, he's just a guy who's been living out there for a long time. He goes, my dad said that, they, and this is what's weird. The dad said not to speak his name. They don't speak his name. Recognition. Yeah. And so you basically, you know, he's like some... But according to his his bolita, his grandmother, she said that at one time, he's a very handsome man, guapo, she said, you know, right? She said, but the thing is that she's like the guy, everybody knows what he is and they just stay away from him. They don't speak his name, but he gets girls that come from other regions to go there, right? And supposedly they never leave, you know, like this guy's doing who knows what. But when you stop and think about it, what if he's doing black magic and doing all kinds of stuff, you know, th this could be, I mean, it, it could be real. I mean, you don't know. I mean, because when you start going down the rabbit hole and you start looking at like ritualistic magic and all this other stuff that, that, that he could be just, his soul could have departed that body a long time ago, whoever originally was born. And it could just be a demon in that body. And I'm not joking. I'm being dead serious. And it could Transform and swoop around at night. It's a lot of weird stuff in Mexico. A lot of weird mm -hmm. things in Mexico. I mean, holy cow. I just hear a lot of weird stories, creatures. And 
things. I mean, it makes you think, though. But like, what about all <clears throat> these other places that have that don't have the technology that we do? Like, what is they? What are the cryptids that they experience? Like, what are the cryptids that? A poor tribe in Afri- Africa has to experience the you cartels know. down there. A lot of them are Satanists. Mm-hmm. And they, oh, yeah. I think well, they Santa Muerta. Well, I mean, Santa you, Muerta, you, yeah. we talked about that story about the cartel having a dogman. I've heard multiple stories of the yeah. cartel having dogman. So I'm sure if they and see something like that. that they that they got them from Cuba, from Cuba, because the Cubans got them from Puerto Rico, and then these cartel guys. You know, there was a guy who who I got a story from who used to work in Colombia. Years ago, and he worked for the Cali, you know, cartel. And he said that they had a chupacabra. You know, he said, dude, they had one on their ranch. And and they would feed it, you know. They would let it, they would all watch it and, you know, and be like, oh, look at this. It's crazy, you know. And and it they all originated from, from these uh, caves. And people would come from San Juan, you know, and they would take them to, to Cuba. And they would pick them up and then they would end up, you know, going over to, uh, you know, Veracruz or wherever in Mexico and, they just pr- proliferated everywhere, and they went everywhere. And then they, they took some to Colombia, Nicaragua, all these different places. You know, and you get all these weird stories, and it's like, you know, what is it? I mean, here's a weird one. You know, well, you know, and here, here, going back to what I said about my friend, who, who was not my friend. I don't know him that well. I didn't know. I was a friend of a friend. This guy named Mark, but he, he was living out in Elroy. And he said they used to burn their trash, but he was told by his neighbor – that there was something out there, right? This Bigfoot type creature. And he said, dude, you know, he goes, I thought the last thing that would happen is I'd be out there burning my trash and this thing would come at me. And he said, he, the only, that was the time when he got a good look at it. But it seemed like when he was out there messing with the trash, he would see it stalking around in the distance. But he thought that it was attracted to the fire because <clears throat> it was cold. And that's when his children saw it was, it was like, so this, if it was a Bigfoot, I've heard that they're afraid of fire. I've heard that many times, but I, I don't know if that's true. But I mean, this thing went over to the fire. I mean, you know, so I don't know how that works. I got I got a weird story. There's a friend of mine. He's, he's used to live out in Seguin, and he said that this uh, highway patrol guy told him years ago. Um, I'm sorry, a, a border patrol to, told him years ago. He's retired. He was living up there. And he said, dude, when I was down on the border, I used to get weird stories. People, they would come, the, the Mexican people would come running up to us saying that something was chasing them. And and sometimes they would describe it as like Bigfoot type creature or like a werewolf. They, they you know, and they, the, the descriptions varied. But they would, they would always say El Chupacabra because everything was a Chupacabra, you know. And, and, and so they would say, oh, Chupacabra, oh, Chupacabra, but then they would give a description and he goes, it would, it would run the gamut, you know? And this guy was down on the border near, uh, Matamoros, you know, near the Gulf. <clears throat> and he said that he was down there in Brownsville and he was, you know, these people were running up to the border, like telling him, Hey man, we're being chased by this something or another, you know? And my friend in Seguin, when, when we started talking about it because, one time when he was driving home from Lockhart to Seguin, he was dating some girl. And these are all Central Texas towns, you know, whatever. And uh, he said, dude, I was driving home. He goes, and I was, I was, I was sleepy. He goes, I'm not going to lie. I was nodding off. He goes, and I see this thing standing in the middle of the road. And he goes, I go to slam on the brakes and then it just walks off. It doesn't even like, doesn't care, you know, at all. He just, and he's like, and he, I got to look up and it was like a human, human looking face with hair all the way around its head and then just brown fur all the way over, all over its body. But the hands and feet were, you know, like, just, like just, yeah, not fur, but more like hair. Right. And he said, it looked Bigfoot like, you know, and he goes, dude. And I was like, I just swerved. And I was like, I think I just almost hit Bigfoot, <laughs> you know? And so he, you know, and I've known this guy for years, you know, and, uh, he used to, used to, used to coach, he used to coach boxing over at, uh, Pan Am. And he told me this story, you know, he's a lot older than me. He's like, dude, I was driving home from my girl's house, man. And he goes, dude, I thought I, he goes, I almost hit Bigfoot. I'm really, literally. <laughs> and it was right outside of Seguin, Texas, you know. And, you know, Seguin is like, there's Seguin and New Braunfels, San Marcos, you know, it's in between here and San Antonio. I mean, th- these reports of these creatures, they're all over the place. Everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. And, and you you know, like I, I tell people, you know, you see, Austin used to live here. It's heavily wooded down here. 
There's woods. Austin is built right into a forest. And so th this whole area from here to San Antonio and everything east of here is just full of woods. Thick, thick woods. Anything can, could live out there. You know, and so people always like, oh, Texas, and they think it's full of tumbleweeds and, you know, we're all riding cows out here and stuff. You East know, but Texas they, is nothing but woods. Oh, God. East Texas is a thicket. But uh, anyway, folks, we, we, we've talked enough tonight, today. Um, Rick's got to get to sleep. I got to get to sleep. We're, it's two in the morning here now, or was it three in the morning? Three in the morning. Yeah. And so we got to get up and get things done tomorrow. I got, you know, business to conduct and things to do. And I got reports like tomorrow, Saturday, I got a, I got an interview to finish up for my book. And hopefully by the time this airs, I'll have that already knocked out. So folks, I appreciate your time. Thank you for tuning in to Paranormal Roundtable. Rick, thank you for sitting in and co-hosting. Tony, uh, everybody here. Thanks for having here. me. It was yeah. I love this stuff. So Yeah. We, we can talk about it all. Day. Oh, yeah. I got a, I got a million stories, dude. Uh, like, like, I just, you know. I guess, you know, there was a guy that was telling me not too long ago that he was having a hard time getting stories from people, and I, he's got a smaller channel. And I said, dude, why? It's not that the, there's as many stories as there are people. You got somebody willing to listen. You got somebody willing to talk. That's right. All you got to do is just listen to them tell you. And, you know, I have a good memory. I have a really sharp memory, and I, and I do have – it's – damn near photographic, but like a lot of people have a hard time and I tell them, you don't, you know, all you got to do is if you're, if you can't remember things, write it down. Cause even I have to use notes and then, you know, record it, get you a little mini tape recorder. I'm giving you some advice. If you're an aspiring podcaster and you want to do this kind of stuff. And, and I, I hope as many people out there can get as many stories as possible because I love to, Retell the stories. I don't care. People are like other people. Well, you know what? I've heard this story before on such and such channel. I don't. You know, I have no rights to these stories. Who gives a crap? If somebody gives me a story, they're going to give to someone else. I'll retell it. Who cares? I mean, we had. That, I'm looking for threads. We had that great guest on not that long ago. That was on Bettina Moss's show, and he did a great Matt Inch. Rich, yeah, Matt. He the retold his story. story, like, you know. And people love it. And then it. we got in the other story that we got, J Jenna Perry. We can say her name. She gave us permission. Jenna Perry, her story. I mean, you got as many stories as you got people, you know. So if, if you're an aspiring podcaster, do yourself a favor and go to people who actually make a podcast and find out how to do it. And if you want to write, if you're an, asp an aspiring author, then I would suggest doing what I did and going to authors and, you know, Asking them how to write a freaking book. Well, and reading too. I think that's an important thing if you want to learn how to write. Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> <laughs> that's a good some of these point. people too, like, like the, the 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 editing is important because punctuation and run on sentences and blah blah blah. Yeah, that's a problem. So I mean, I'm not an English major like Lyle, you know, or or whatever. And I'm I haven't written a bunch of books like David and Ken and Barton and all of them, but you know, I'm I'm, I'm doing two right now, and I'm hoping that I will do more. And I'm trying to get as many people's stories as I could, I mean, as possibly can, because whenever someone says, have you ever heard of something like this? Yes, I have heard of something like that. Doesn't mean it's going to be exactly that, but I've heard of something like that. You'd be surprised what I've heard, right? Yeah, you'd be surprised. <laughs> so, so, you know, you go down the rabbit hole with us and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Paranormal Roundtable. This stuff's easy, man. It's just, you know, it's it's fun to, to do. And it sometimes I don't want to, you know, come into the studio. I was kind of dragging today, but Rick was here and it was just, it was awesome to sit and talk with him and talk about all the things we did. Check out the live stream that Rick was on and these two episodes that Rick co-hosted. And uh, I appreciate you coming down from Virginia. My pleasure. Yep. My pleasure. And check us out at the conference. So thank you, everyone. Go to Eventbrite, get your tickets to the conference so you can meet all these wonderful people, podcasters, authors, researchers. Thank you and good night.